Since time immemorial, the seas, particularly along the coasts, have been used as a means of transport of persons and goods. That's the obvious use. We sail uh, the seas. Uh, also, this should not be forgotten, the sea has been used as a place for transporting soldiers and of naval warfare. The Romans, for example, used the Mediterranean, which they called Mare Nostrum, our sea, not only for peaceful trade, but also for extending their empire and fighting their enemies like the ancient North African Carthago. However, trade and warfare are not the only elements associated with uh, sailing the seas. In the age of discoveries, in particular, humans were looking for new passengers, islands and continents. They were driven by curiosity, by the desire to discover and by the hope to gain wealth. While some areas were easier to navigate than others, it was the most hostile environment at the poles that fascinated adventurers and researchers for a long time. Finding a passage along the American continent that connects the Atlantic Ocean with the Pacific, the Northwest Passage, has been a dream and a curse alike for many brave people. Nowadays, with the receding ice due to climate change, new opportunities for shipping in the Arctic are viewed from an economic perspective. Let us have a closer look at such opportunities but also at the environmental concerns associated with shipping and more generally at the question how shipping is governed on the international level. The freedom of navigation is one of the core freedoms of the high seas, but that does not mean that shipping cannot be regulated. Indeed, shipping is very well regulated, and we currently learn a lot from the international regulations of shipping for other areas of ocean governance. Different aspects of regulation that can have an impact on the protection of the oceans from pollution can be distinguished. Regulating, rather prohibiting, activities on board of vessels that pollute the oceans, such as garbage disposal at sea, washing oil tanks at sea with seawater dumping. Second, regulate the design and construction of ships to make them greener or safer. For example, regulating fuel content or making double hull tankers obligatory. Third, prevent collisions and other accidents by making navigation safer. For example, by traffic separation schemes in busy areas or oblige states to have high standards in training their seafarers. Can you imagine what the sinking of the RMS Titanic in 1912 has to do with modern international regulation? It was this tragic accident that resulted in regulating the safety of people at sea, crew and passengers alike. They were the primary issue of concern and resulted in an important multilateral treaty, the International Convention on the Safety of Life at Sea, abbreviated SOLAS. It regulated such seemingly profane things like the sufficient number of life vests and lifeboats and ships in cases of emergency. And the revised and adapted version of this convention from the times of the Titanic aftermath is still today's guiding legal instrument for safety matters at sea. And it will contain modern safety standards for navigation in polar waters in 2017, which are more important the more vessels will seek to navigate in the Arctic. Later on, regulation to protect the marine environment from pollution during normal operation and as a consequence of accidents followed. This also includes regulation on liability to pay for cleanup and damages resulting from oil pollution. It's needless to say that much damage will be irreversible. Think about an oil tanker accident in the Arctic how much in financial value is the loss of some pristine environment with difficulties in putting a number to such damage. Today, the International Maritime Organization is responsible for all aspects of shipping. Under their roof, legally binding instruments have been adopted that cover the whole life cycle of a ship, from construction, normal operation, accident prevention and response, liability, up to ship recycling. Many instruments have two or more objectives, so regulations to prevent collisions at sea, for example, enhance the safety of crew and passengers, as well as protects the environment from the consequences of an accident. Remember that not only oil tanker accidents result in extreme pollution when they break apart or sink. It's also the fuel carried by any ship that is a significant source of dramatic pollution in the case of accidents. Thanks to regulatory efforts, new technologies and developments, uh, shipping is now a comparably clean means of transport. If calculated by the unit of cargo transported, it's even the greenest mode of transport. This, however, does not mean that we can now lean back and leave shipping to itself. Even a relatively green sector of, environmental, of international transport can be made cleaner and safer 
to use the oceans in a sustainable manner. Let us have a look at the regulation of fuel as an example. Unlike cars, ships can run on a variety of different fuels that differ with regard to their content of hazardous pollutants. The IMO has been very busy to establish a legally binding plan to phase out inter alia high, sulf high sulfur contents in fuel. A progressive reduction of sulfur content in marine fuels shall help to reduce air pollution from shipping that in turn also pollutes the ocean. So pollution via the air is an important source of um, marine pollution. On the one hand, there are no specific areas in which particularly strict standards apply, so-called emission control areas. On the other hand, the progressive reduction is necessary because what ships can do is to have different kinds of fuel on board, heavy oil as well as marine diesel. And they can switch to clean fuels when they need to and back to dirty fuels when they um, leave an emission control area or a port. In practice, that means if a ship is in an EU port, where already only diesel with a very low sulfur content is allowed, and once it gets to the high seas, it switches back to heavy oil. When, and when it enters an emission control area, it switches back to clean fuel, and so on and so on. Now, international rules are addressing these and other problems, such as greenhouse gas emissions from ships. While greenhouse gas emissions from ships might seem only a small contribution compared to industrialized states, the shipping sector is predicted to grow again after the global economic crisis and should be part of efforts to curb emissions. Let's turn to the Arctic. In 2014, the first cargo vessel made its way through the Arctic Northwest Passage without the assistance of an icebreaker. Of course, the ship was a polar-class vessel to break ice of a, certain, of a certain thickness itself, but still the opportunities for commercial shipping seem spectacular. We've seen that fuel is the most important contributor to shipping costs. Another one related to fuel is time. What could be better than new navigational routes for commercial shipping that save time and fuel? The Northwest Passage is about 40% shorter than the way through the Panama Canal, and the passage is also deeper, which allows the use of even larger vessels. From an economic perspective, it would make great sense to use the new shipping routes in the Arctic, at least during summer, to allow commercial shipping through the Northwest Passage and the Northern Sea Route, which runs along the Russian waters connecting the Pacific with Northern Europe. Does it make sense from the perspective of a sustainable use of the oceans? While the thinning and recession of the Arctic ice is a result of dramatic climatic changes induced by human activities, it seems that the world is eager to use the opportunities for further activities that in turn add pressures on the environment. The Arctic is very special. From the perspective of international law, however, the Arctic Ocean, whether frozen or not, is treated like any other sea. There's currently no special regime for the Arctic and its special environment, but only one provision in the Convention on the Law of the Sea on ice-covered waters that allows strictest environmental standards by coastal states. This is very different if you compare that to Antarctica, where we have a continent surrounded by water and not water surrounded by continents. For Antarctica, there's a special legally binding treaty regime, the Antarctic Treaty System, which regulates all aspects of the use of a continent explicitly dedicated to peace and science, and it knows strict environmental regulations. The states bordering the Arctic have made very clear that they do not envisage any comparable treaty system for the Arctic. Although there's the Arctic Environmental Protection Strategy, this is a non-binding instrument and can only give some guidance on human behavior in the Arctic. And hence, shipping could pose a significant threat to the marine environment. Imagine a major accident by a cargo vessel or an oil tanker. This could destroy large parts of the unique environment uh, in the Arctic forever. Moreover, navigation in icy waters poses a lot of challenges even to experienced crews. At the same time, rescue operations are more difficult. And again, it's the International Maritime Organization, which is responsible for regulating shipping on the international level that has been active in drafting the so-called Polar Code. As of now, the instrument with very detailed regulation on enhanced safety of ships in polar waters is not binding, but it's expected to enter into force in 2017. It will then be part of SOLAS, supplementing and modernizing the convention stemming from 1913. The code addresses construction and design, as well as equipment and questions of manning and operation. 
as such, it will also contribute to prevent hazard, hazards to the marine environment, but it's not, not, a, not a classical environmental treaty, it's a safety code. We should not forget that all other rules on shipping apply to the Arctic as well. The prohibition of waste disposal at sea, the provision, prohibition of dumping and other vessel-based uh, pollution is valid for the Arctic Ocean as it is for the tropics. With regard to emergency response, the states bordering the Arctic have agreed on a search and rescue convention that should allow for quick and coordinated action in the case of emergency. Apart from this, it will depend on the status of the waters in the Arctic who is responsible to regulate passage. Even if the result will be that shipping cannot be restricted altogether because of the freedom of navigation, coastal states can provide for strict environmental legislation in their waters to prevent risk for the Arctic environment which is already under great pressure from climate change. To summarize, we've learned that transportation by vessels is relatively clean if compared to other modes of transportation, but we should strive to make it even cleaner and prevent vessel-based pollution. Shipping is well regulated and the responsible organization, the IMO, is active in addressing new challenges. Although the Arctic is very special and vulnerable, there are currently no regulations specifically addressing the Arctic environment. Commercial shipping in the Arctic is an economic opportunity, but comes with a risk to the marine environment. The IMO has developed a polar code to make shipping in icy waters safer, in addition to other existing international laws on shipping.